Welcome to our live stream event with Irish composer Dave Flynn. I'm John Schaefer, host of WNYC's long-running New Sounds program. And uh, Dave Flynn's new album is called Irish Minimalism. I just happen to have a copy of it handy. Dave is joining us not from Ireland, but in fact from the almost exact opposite part of the world. He's in New Zealand. Dave, it's good to see you. Great to see you too, John. Thanks for joining me for this. Yeah, this this record is full of interesting ideas and music, and just the title is, on some level, a provocative one. Irish mm. minimalism. I mean, yeah. the, the contemporary musical style known as minimalism is very much an American and, dare I even say, a New York creation. You know, you think yeah. people like Steve Reich and Philip Glass. For you... What is Irish minimalism? What's the connection? Well, um, I guess I've been interested in both Irish traditional music and, and uh, minimalist music, whether it be the New York minimalism or um, what they call holy minimalism of uh, Arvo Pert and Goretzky. And then there was the, the Dutch minimalism of Louis Andreessen. So um, I was interested in the connections between uh, Irish music and um, minimalist music and in some ways I think of traditional Irish music as a kind of an early form of minimalism because some of the the traits of traditional Irish music are found in, in uh, minimalist music well just the subtle variation of kind of uh, modal music um, there's um, you know developmental uh, it's kind of the harmony tends to be static a lot of the time there's mm. drones uh from illum pipes um of course there's quite there's big differences too like um but um just the best way of showing it actually maybe i'll play a little something of an old mm -hmm. irish an old irish jig um juxtaposed with a bit of philip glass like intro okay so, uh, um so this is an old irish slip jig called drops of Brandy, and it's with a kind of a Philip Glass intro. So, uh. So when we talk about minimalism, Dave, we often, uh, it's kind of a signifier of music that has a, a kind of repetitive cast to it. Yeah. Although it's not as literally repetitive as it often sounds. And I suppose you could say the same thing about a slip jig, a, a, a lot of traditional Irish music, right? Yeah, yeah, because, um, yeah, it never repeats exactly. A, a good traditional musician will always be adding in ornamentations, variations, melodic variations and sometimes it could be quite uh the variations can be quite uh elaborate you know mm -hmm. um, especially there like there was a guy called tommy potts a fiddle player who really went into strange variations of traditional music um so yeah it, it's a that subtle variation if you don't listen to it properly if you kind of listen in the background it can all sound the same to you but it's it's kind of um 
deep listening, I think, is a term that's used these days. It, it yep. reveal, reveals the complexity and um, the hidden complexity of Irish music is something I've written about as well. And, um, and well, the idea, the idea that listening shouldn't be a passive experience, but an active one that, you yeah. know. Yeah. That, and and um, that, that we as listeners have a, a function to play in the music making process as well. Exactly, yeah. And uh, I know like in for traditional music, for example, there's very serious listening goes on, say, if there's fiddle players or pipers playing that, that's the, they'd be listening for the slightest variation. And it's just like the skill of a, oh, listen to that. It might be like one or two notes, uh, just changing the melody slightly. And, and the way a musician does it, um, is a, it's a sign of their skill. Right. So let's uh, let's hear an excerpt from the new record from Irish Minimalism. Your string quartet number two is called The Cranning, and it yeah. is full of these techniques, these rhythms, these uh, ornamentations that you have taken from traditional Irish music and put into a contemporary classical format. Yeah. Uh, having heard you just play a slip jig, it makes sense, I suppose, to hear the slip movement, the first movement. Exactly. Yeah. What what is how do you define a slip jig? What should we be listening for here rhythmically? Yeah, so a slip jig is a kind of, usual the normal kind of Irish jig is a six eight rhythm, um, but a slip jig is a nine eight rhythm, and um, I was playing it there. Now normally they're played a good bit faster than I played, so like yeah. Yeah. A, a bit more vigorously. <laughs> So, um, yeah, it's quite a vigorous opening movement. It's You hear that 9-8 rhythm, but at the beginning, it's kind of fractured. It's it's kind of a bit of a cheeky opening, shall we say. And eventually, the kind of slip jig rhythms come in. But it's not copying traditional Irish music. There's no traditional melodies in it. It's all my own kind of melodies. But you hear some of the kind of ornamentation and basically the slip jig rhythm. All right, this is uh, an excerpt from Dave Flynn's The Cranning, his string quartet number two. So that's a little bit of the slip movement, the opening movement from the Cranning, which is Dave Flynn's string quartet number two. And Dave, it, it takes a moment or two at the beginning to kind of pull itself together, and then yeah. finally hit that nine-eight rhythm, that slip yeah. rhythm you were talking about. Uh, the performers here are the Contempo Quartet. What was it like yeah. working with them on this this project? Oh, Contempo are a brilliant quartet. Um, they're they've been the the ensemble in residence in Galway on the west coast of Ireland for I think about twenty years now, and I've been working with them uh, going back to two thousand and seven. I think is when I first worked with them, and uh, they're a wonderful group. They're all originally from Romania, um, and they just they have a, an amazing passion for music, amazing technique, and it was quite interesting bringing them ideas from traditional Irish music. I mean, they've they've worked with traditional Irish musicians during their residency, like um, Martin O'Connor. Uh, but I, I was bringing techniques to the string quartet that they'd never played before. And I remember in one rehearsal, one of the musicians just kind of looked at me and said, David, you're telling us to do all the things we were told not to do at the conservatory. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, it wasn't just Irish traditional music that served as a, a kind of a blueprint for this piece, The Cranning. No, because no. strangely, in Movement 3, we find ourselves in West Africa <laughs> yeah. with a piece called Bamako Highland, which is that, that title refers to a kind of a collision of two different musical styles, right? Yeah. So um, I maybe about 20 years ago, I first heard some music from Mali, um, Super Rail Band of Bamako and... Uh, famous Tumani. band, yeah, famous yeah. Uh, guitar-led band. Yeah, and uh, Tumani Jibate, the chorus player. Yep. But I suppose this, and then uh, uh, around the same time I was going up to Donegal in the, the northwest coast of Ireland and where there's a type of a tune called a Highland, which is derived from Scotland. It has mm -hmm. uh, this connections between Donegal and Scotland. And I just kind of, there's a hypnotic quality to the Highland rhythm and it kind of sinks in a bit with some of the rhythms uh, and even the melodic kind of textures found in um, super rail band music. So I guess I just kind of tried to put them together in a funny kind of way in the string quartet. And uh, the reaction from the players, uh, did their heads explode when you presented them with this or? <laughs> um, no, I, th I think this, this part of it isn't too difficult. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, but it takes it takes time to explain the rhythm something because when you notate things it's it's very hard to get the subtleties of of rhythm and ornaments in notation so i i, I work i like to work very directly with musicians yeah. when i can to, to to show them especially with rhythm it's so hard to notate swing you know absolutely yeah, yeah whether we're talking about big band jazz or west african big band music or uh you know celtic traditional music from the islands uh let's let's hear a little bit of of how this piece turned out this is a uh, bamako highland it's the third movement from dave's string quartet number no. two the cranning You know, as as we follow along, Dave, with uh, some of the printed score for these clips, I'm yeah. reminded of another similarity between um, your music and the music, say, of John Adams, Steve Reich, the American minimalists. And that is, if you blink, you lose your place on the page and then you are sunk. I mean, I have, <laughs> I have turned pages for, for John Adams' Phrygian Gates or China Gates, and it's just like, I mean, we were talking about active listening before. This was like super active reading. If you just, <laughs> <laughs> uh, because, you know, the, the kind of the, the repetition and the, the tiny changes from literal repetition, you know, they go by really fast. It's such a key part of this music. Yeah, it is, and um, in, in, I've had experiences like that too, even playing where, like, a, there was one unfortunate instance where the music stand fell over <laughs> in the middle of a piece in a guitar quartet. Luckily, I managed to recover it, but it, yeah, if you lose your place in this kind of music, it's very hard to get back. Um, but yeah, um, I suppose you're trying to, the difference, a big difference between classical music and and traditional music is uh, classical music is generally all written down, everything meticulously notated, and Irish fiddle players, pipers, it's a lot of improvising, subtle improvising. Um, and so what I'm trying to do in these pieces is kind of a halfway house is kind of um, programming in some of the uh, kind of sense of variation and improvisation mm -hmm. into a notated piece, you know? Right. Um, the, I mentioned a couple of times now that this string quartet number two is called The Cranning. Tell, tell us where that title comes from. Yeah, um, Cranning is a, an ornament from the Illum Pipes, the Irish bagpipe, the Illum Pipes. And uh, in traditional Irish music, it's we try and recreate it on uh, different instruments, 
it's it's best recreated on fiddle really and flute but I, there's a kind of a guitar version of cranning which it's best described as a gurgling d note um so it's kind of like <laughs> So uh, you're not really, if you were to see that in notation and show it to a uh, purely classically trained musician, they might go. So um, you kind of, when I notate it, and you might see it in the score, there's X's crosses, which, which illustrate, you know, that you're not putting your finger down fully on the string. And that's a real key of a lot of Irish ornaments. Takes takes a bit of time to figure out how to do this. Yeah. So in the cranning, uh, in this uh, the final movement of the cranning, the string I transfer this cranning technique to all the instruments of the string quartet, and they uh, they just the crans gurgle against each other, and then eventually there's a kind of a sound like I try and recreate the sound of the Elam pipes and the drones and regulators are the harmony kind of producing buttons on a right. yellow pipes and so right. that's that, kind of the the regulators the, being the sort of secondary notes of of the yellow pipe apart from the chanter which, which yeah plays, exactly yeah. That's it, um yeah. so let let's let's hear all those piping techniques transferred to the contempo string quartet here's a little bit of cran which is the final movement from the cranning That's some more music from the new album, Irish Minimalism by Dave Flynn. Uh, you heard the Contempo Quartet playing Cran, uh, using this cranning technique borrowed from the Illin Pipes. It's, you've written it into the score, you know, in the directions to the players. There's a, I, I thought I saw a little Irish inscription on the bottom of the next to last page. What was that? Oh, there's quite a few in the piece, so I can't remember which one it is, you know. Um, uh, and I, I, is... I, oh, I, th I think I remember it was Dune de Thule, Neoloc. Uh, it basically means close your eyes, you've only the one note to play. It, this is for the drones. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, the idea of sort of bringing the, the world of ill and pipe music to the string quartet uh, when we get to your piece, The Cutting, in a few minutes, we will actually hear the literal Illin pipes exactly, mixed yeah. in with, with string quartet. But before we leave just straight ahead string quartet writing, uh, which is front and center in, in throughout this record, uh, there's a piece on the album called The Keening, which, of course, is a traditional vocal style. Uh, 
Hmm. And in the movement called the Murmuring Lament, you're dealing with a very specific and a very specifically Irish form of singing. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so um, here I'm trying to transfer some aspects of Shanno singing. That means old style singing. Um, and that's the old traditional, very ancient form of uh, Irish singing. And um, again, it's got its very specific kind of ornaments and styles. A lot of it is these yearning slides, oh, that kind of a thing. And there's, there's also kind of gurgling kind of vocal ornaments that come. I don't know exactly how they're done, but they're somehow in the in the back of the throat or something like that. Um, and uh, so I'm trying to transfer some of these to the string quartet. And, and what you'll hear here is um, just the end of a bit of murmuring kind of sounds, because the keen, the traditional Irish keen, it comes in three stages, murmuring, dirge and cry. Cry is the what we all know as the kind of the visceral keening. But um, in the traditional old keen at funerals, it started with murmuring the um, deceased's name over and over and over again. So there's a bit of a kind of an imitation of that uh, with bubbling ornaments and then eventually the cello comes in with this yearning and um you know quite moving kind of sound mm. and again not an actual quote from an old shano song but a, an original melody in that style right yeah basically yeah and if you look people who read sheet music will see the score and it looks quite complex and contemporary music looking because there's you know microtones and Sandy and things like that and and it's an example like if you want to try and transfer authentically uh ornaments and things from traditional music it, it, it's a lot more complex than when you open up a tune book yeah and you know uh as with most of the world's traditional musics not confined to the 12 notes that you have on your guitar there or that we would have on, on a western piano so hence hence the microtones sound scary but when people hear them in context it's just you know that's what gives the the melody its emotional heft absolutely yeah yeah all right so let's let's hear a little bit of the murmuring lament this is from uh, dave's string quartet called the keening Dave, another question just based on what we just saw as opposed to heard. What is the table of drones that the cellist is supposed to start playing from as that clip ends? Oh, yeah. So um, at the very start of a score for the musicians, there's table of drones and table of ornaments. And they're um, 
various notated versions of drones and ornaments with variations in them that I give the musicians freedom to kind of improvise with. So you don't just have a straight drone that you, there's all these kind of subtle burb, uh, bubblings and murmurs going on. There's a table mm -hmm. of murmur, murmurs as well. Okay. Um, as appropriate for a piece called The Murmuring Lament uh, from Dave's string quartet, The Keening. Now, you were talking before, Dave, about working with Contempo, who we just heard again there, and, you know, bringing them this music and one of them saying, we were told not to do this in, in music school. <laughs> uh, the next string quartet that we'll hear is actually a quintet with the Illin Pipes, and it's played by a different group, the IMO Quartet. I'm guessing you didn't have to do so much explaining of all of these techniques to, to to them because this is what they grew up with right yeah exactly um so the imo quartet it's it's based it's musicians from my ensemble the irish memory orchestra and, and the irish memory orchestra it mixes musicians who are classically trained and also play traditional music some of them play jazz and, and various styles as well so uh the the, the members of the imo string quartet they understand classical music very well they read sheet music and they they did all the grades and college but they also learned traditional music from a young age so they have all these techniques in their in their you know system so you don't have to write it all out for them you just and even you give them freedom to ornament and you can write in the ornaments but you're happy when they vary it themselves you know um so it, it's kind of easier for me as a composer to work in that way because i don't have to spend so much time notating <laughs> the music out um but it's a very specific group of, of musicians so i also have to create scores that are in more detailed mm. um for other groups sure yeah 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 because yeah. uh, contempo have played these pieces also but, mm -hmm. um, but in terms of what you were talking about before trying to find that way of bringing the improvisatory quality into a thoroughly composed piece with with IMO, you know, you can you can sort of give them a little bit of free reign, right? Absolutely, yeah. And, yeah. and I really encourage that. And it's the same with the the Piper uh, Mick O'Brien. Like we'll be showing a bit of the score, but if you're a really good sight reader, you might see them moving, varying a bit from the score, and that's that's perfectly okay. You know. All right, so let's uh, we'll hear the uh, the opening of the first movement of this quintet for Illin Pipes and String Quartet. It's called The Cutting. Yeah. So that's how it opens. Yeah, uh, Dave. If we skip to the end of this this movement, what what's happening here? Um, yeah. So at the beginning, you had a kind of a minimalist process of gradually adding notes into what's essentially a, a Kerry polka rhythm, an uh -huh. undulating rhythm. So this very brings... much what Philip Glass used to call his additive process. Ex exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. And um, then that builds and builds, and eventually the pipes. They're just doing a drone there, but eventually the pipes come in and play a melody. And by the end of it, all the musicians are kind of more into a more developed melodic kind of style, like an Irish polka. Mm -hmm. and, uh, that's basically what you hear at the end. All right. So it's the same piece of music, but now let's skip to the end of it. So, Dave, um, this piece refers to cutting and rolling. Yeah. What are those pipe or fiddle techniques? Yeah, they're um, they're in the pipes and the fiddles. They're they're the, the kind of fundamental ornaments in traditional music. Uh, like a, a cutting is basically a cut is a 
it's like a grace note, but it's a bit different. Like in classical music, a grace note would be like this. But in uh, Irish music, you don't really hear the, the ornamenting note. You just go. And when you're using string instruments, you just kind of flick the string. Like that. Okay. And uh, a roll, it's quite hard to do on the guitar. It's a kind of a piping and fiddle or one. Uh, if, if you see it notated in books, it looks like a turn, a classical ornament known as a turn. They often use the same symbol, but it's actually quite different. Like a, a turn would be like... <laughs> But uh, the 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 roll is much quicker. It's it's quite hard to do yeah. on the guitar, but because you're you're ornamenting both up and down, but yeah, up, above and below the the basic note, right? Yeah, but uh, not really. You don't really want to clearly hear the note above and below. So it's kind of like uh, there's another ornament called a treble, and that's kind of Mm, so it's yeah. so you could kind of want that effect but with the nose it's much easier to do on the fiddle than the yeah. guitar <laughs> <laughs> um well fortunately you have a couple of fiddles in the uh, the, the quintet there with the illin pipes and the string quartet um one of the other works on irish minimalism on the new record is called stories from the old world and here you are explicitly bringing in pre-existing material maybe not musical but yeah but actual story how well known are these stories in ireland um well the stories themselves would be well known uh within irish speakers with irish language speakers because they're all the gaelic language um particularly down in kerry where the, the stories come from the author of the the stories they're, they're, they're like orally told stories um and traditional so uh, they come from peg sayers who was an extraordinary lady from the turn of the 20th century she died in 1958 i think and um now her she she's kind of notorious in ireland and it's not her fault it's uh, there was a her autobiography was was became a text for learning irish in school uh peg and it was kind of sanitized a bit uh -huh. it, and um she was actually quite a character and quite funny and um and uh, there's stuff that she would have written about or, or spoken her stories that you wouldn't be able to put in a textbook for your <laughs> children <laughs> so um she grew up on the the blasket islands off of kerry which are now abandoned there's nobody living on them but it was a very harsh lifestyle and so that's explained in in her book and then it's in quite complicated irish so for people who were learning this um it, it was it was very hard you know i never had to do it myself because by the time i got around to the exams they had taken peg off the curriculum mm. but uh so she's very famous in ireland uh and kind of unfairly notorious she was a, a much much better character than uh her reputation okay um and we're going to hear two excerpts, both featuring the same vocalist, but in one piece, he's narrating, speaking, and in another piece, he's singing. How did you, what was, what lay behind that compositional choice? Um, it was really the, the stories, because uh, this was a commission uh, from a Kerry Chamber Music Festival, uh Engegard quartet who used to run a festival there and um the idea was to take stories from fine stories that peg told uh in the blasket island center which has all these things so I, I researched stories and found ones i liked and one of them was actually a song and that's why so it's it's basically uh the piper and the landlady of peeber august bannon tower is the irish and the piper and the landlady and so it's it was a song, but I did didn't have any music to match it with, so I wrote my own melody. Okay. And uh, and then the other uh, excerpt we'll hear from the old hags, Nashan Kailaka. That's a really classic of the Irish oral uh, kind of tradition. Um, a tale about you know three uh, witches basically, and it, it's full of metaphors. Mm -hmm. 
All right, we'll hear that one first. And, and I'm, I'm interested to know which came first. Did you write the music for the string quartet before Brendan Begley recorded the narration, or did you take his narration and the rhythms of the speech and use that to drive the music? Um, well, I wrote the music. The, 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 I wrote the music first, and I was thinking of the narration. I was, uh, I had great help from um, some friends down in Kerry who translated it into English, and then they did the narration, um, put it on tape. So I was working with that, trying to make music that kind of winded with the mm -hmm. rhythms of the Irish language. So then, when Brendan came to record it. Um, I think he recorded it without the music in the background. So he was just recording it, telling it, and then we kind of fit it on to the music. And, and we've done it live a few times with Brendan and uh, it, it works beautifully. And it's it's different each time because I don't tell him you have to say this here. It's kind of up to him to to phrase it as he likes. You know? All right. Here's a little bit from uh, the old hags, part of the, the suite called Stories from the Old World. Vi lånun an fado ag sian dat ho nitr na stik sin le an tier ag stir vein te gele aun e gaun a khe hastig o ar tie dat an dagen ag es han sian mach ag es khu sian dagen ag es nie tie dat es dag har nas sin le an li si rode dag gur es sie hein in a heiler ag es de wie si e tuk allen ag es dag nie je ga hab no hi he de wel shan khalach stach ho Slavin da hira, slavin da hardail, agat vanity, tur duin, ar skrug ar nain. Turud as the vanity, achemesh shadiatagum. Mi vadege, the hainigan tadakala. Slavin da hira, slavin da hardail, agat vanity, tur duin, ar skrug ar nain. Go to Duchi, achemesh shadiatagum. Agat son. Heinig und da halacht ihr. Slavin da Hira, Slavin da Hardal, Agasavana Ti, Turduin, Arschkrug, Arnain. Gioschiv, Hanian Men Pladi. Daschke der Hüge, Agasnir Bur, a Vidaka Ejan. Turchi do, Nervin Plani Dientako, Turchi, Gagadisht Erauru. Nir Bur, a Vidaka. Nervis von Dientako, Dolerigider, Arschkrug, Arnain. So there's, even though he's not singing, there's something very musical about that text, Dave. Uh, it even has a chorus, you know, a couple of yeah. lines that he comes back to several times. Yes, yes. I don't understand a word of it, but it sounds musical to me. Yeah, it is. And, and the Irish language is very musical. There's a rhythm to it. And, and you know, a lot of, Irish traditional music comes out of the voice. It comes out of the language, because um, you know a lot of the old tunes. They're songs that became instrumentals, or they're still sung as songs. And obviously, the language is going to the rhythm of the language is going to have an effect on on the rhythm of the music. It's like in in any traditional music, right? And and as with Indian classical music, where all the sitar music and sarod music, it all comes from the voice. The, the exactly, voice, yeah. 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 Um, so now that's Brendan Begley um, narrating. Later in the piece, uh, you mentioned the, the excerpt, The Piper and the Landlady. He is actually singing. Is he singing in a, a particular style? Yeah, well, his uh, Brendan's from Dingle in Kerry. Um, this is the language he's singing is his native language. It's his first language. And uh, he's singing in a in the Shannos kind of style, the old style, um, and he's a beautiful singer and a wonderful accordionist as well. And uh, yeah, it's it's basically what you hear here is a good example of the Shannos style, but in a kind of a, a jig song. We call it a, a type of a song that's like in a jig rhythm. Um, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's it's it's kind of a a. Uh, humorous kind of style it's got it's it's a bit more light-hearted than the the slow kind of sean knows mournful songs you know right right and and the language since he's from the dingle peninsula there so this would be a, a kind of a regional dialect of of irish 
Yeah, and this is an older dialect, and even he knows. Uh, there's, I remember working with him on it. There were a few words that he wouldn't use anymore, and uh, um, but so he changed a few of them to suit his own, his own kind of modernize them a bit to, to what would be naturally spoken in Dingle now. Okay. So, uh, again, this is the IMO Quartet playing with him, right? Yeah, this is the IMO Quartet, yeah. Yeah, and Brendan Begley. Uh, here's uh, a little bit of the Piper and the Landlady. Gavlachin was scored of the shalas <laughs> mafi. Shalal the wada, the lawn of Magadil. Eshtem legard, a kudimachan tadigil. The frabshid and darshing, the shkabo hatagil. It's pinging me hora, the ravach wind in fee. So a little bit of uh, The Piper and the Landlady. The album is called Irish Minimalism. Um, in some of the, the tracks on stories from the old world, the, the minimalism aspect is less obvious. Is it still there for you as a composer? Yeah, um, definitely in some of the movements, um, particularly the, when the pipes come in, the instrumental sections, there's, there's some of that... Uh, minimalist process music but it's probably less obvious because it's more in the background in the string quartet writing um it there, there's there's definite elements of it like um when uh, we were recording this uh, we had judy sherman the great uh, multi-grammy winning producer working with us on this and and she was brilliant uh, to work with and she went through the scores with me and she basically she looked at the end of uh stories from the old world and she says oh that's i see steve reich steve reich processes in there you know yeah uh, um th well, this kind she, of she would know having worked yeah. for many years with chronos quartet and many many others yeah yeah and um so she noticed like the, there's a steve's technique of uh it's kind of a reductive technique where you gradually take away material um it's kind of the opposite of the additive process and it's, right it's, yeah uh, so there's a bit of that goes on in the um, at the end of the the final movement. Or no, it's not the final movement. It's um, the second movement. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so there there is various minimalist processes, and even in the old hags, it's kind of uh, one melody is repeated in the violin, and then each other instrument plays the same melody, but off off a beat, so they kind of loop around each other, and that's not too far away from some of our Perts kind of. Um, right techniques and, and also when you you know you mentioned the holy minimalists quote unquote you know henrik goretzky arvo pert uh john taverner um you know there's less kind of obvious repetition in that music and it's more about space and a kind of sense of spirit yeah and when i think of sean no singing i i think it's not so very far removed from from that sonic world yeah, yeah. I mean, Shadno singing is a very spiritual singing, and, and there's a particular type. Uh, you see it in some, uh, there's a winding where the singer will hold the hand of some person behind him and wind, like it's a kind of a comfort thing, and it's very spiritual, and they'll close their eyes, and they'll get deep into the singing, and everyone around will generally close their eyes and be very hush-hush. And um, and this can be in a pub, you know, where yeah. people are having a pint, but to... But, uh, this happens sometimes more towards the end of the night, but then they have singing circles as well. And um, if you get into a good, find a good singing session like that, it's really like a spiritual experience. Yeah. Yeah. So what happens next? I mean, uh, you know, when, when in the fullness of time, you're able to leave New Zealand and head back to Ireland, the, uh, the Irish memory orchestra is there waiting for you touring. Yeah. What, what happens next? Yeah, um, so next April, uh, I'll be back in Ireland and the Irish Memory Orchestra is doing a big concert in Galway playing a piece of mine called The Vision Symphony, which uh, is an, a very unusual piece. It was written to include blind and visually impaired musicians. And um, um, the Irish Memory Orchestra 
as the mem name might suggest, plays by memory. Um, and so this is a symphony that everyone plays by memory, and that allows access for blind and visually impaired musicians to join in. So that's a, a being performed in April in Galway in Ireland, April the 16th at the Black Box Theatre. Um, and I'm also premiering a piece with another uh, uh, Oriel traditional orchestra, a different orchestra um, that I've recently completed called the Oriel Suite. And I'm doing, an, I have a new piece with Contempo Quartet also in Galway uh, next year uh, for electric guitar and string quartet, and I'll be playing with them. But um, yeah, the future, the Irish Memory Orchestra, I just hope to bring it more internationally. It'd be great to bring them to America for the first time. We've played yeah. in, we've played in London, in Moscow, in South Korea, um, and all over Ireland. So it be, when when things are fully opened up, it'd be brilliant to bring the string. And also just, um, you know, I'm, I'm open to all sorts of collaborations with musicians. I've been fortunate to be able to come to America a few times and yeah. The cra the Cranning was premiered in uh, MoMA at the Summer Garden Festival by the Juilliard, New Juilliard Ensemble. And so more of that would be great. Yeah. yeah. So I, I have a, a question for you. Not my own question. Uh, Zane, one of our viewers, asks, what's your approach to balancing the elements of minimalism with the variation slash improvisational needs of the performers and material you were pulling from? How do you thread that needle? Whew, that's a tough question. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Zane. Zane's a great guitarist. I met Zane at Scotland a few years ago. Um, I guess it depends on the piece, but sometimes the minimalism is written into the background of the music, and then the improvisational need of the performer is in, in the soloist, so in stories from the old world and the cutting, the, the pipes get more chance to improvise, I suppose, than the, in the score. But like with the Irish Memory Orchestra, I write out the music, it's all written out, but there's freedom to improvise as well. So I'm not too worried about if the exact minimalist technique is upended for a good variation, you know? <laughs> um, I do have a final question. In, in, in writing the liner notes for your album, um, Irish Minimalism, I, I sort of posited this theory that because you are specifically a guitarist, that you had a kind of access point to both traditional music and minimalism, that the guitar as an instrument moves easily between all these different musical worlds. You didn't tell me to take it out, so I'm going to assume it wasn't totally wrong. Uh, have you found the guitar to be a kind of musical ambassador slash crossroads slash stepping stone for you? Yeah, definitely. Like I, I play and work across many different styles. I started off as a rock guitarist and, um, uh, you know, I've that played with jazz musicians. Uh, one of the members of the Irish Memory Orchestra, Noel Tumbu, he's originally from the Congo and we played together quite a bit. He's an amazing guitarist, like yep. the best, the best I've ever met. Um, so yeah, the guitar, definitely it's an instrument that's common to most musics and even like if it's not a guitar it's a guitar like instrument like a sitar or sarad or something like that so that kind of the, the plucked string uh, instrument it's so common throughout the world and even within ireland even though the guitar is kind of a controversial instrument in traditional irish music in that it, it's not a traditional instrument it's not been there from the early ages but the irish harp is the oldest kind of uh, the ancient Irish harp music was the old Irish, the old art music of Ireland was Irish harp music. And so the guitar can emulate that. And, mm -hmm. and um, some of the guitarists in traditional music do that really. Like that's something I try and bring across. And Steve Cooney is a wonderful guitarist for bringing that the harp technique into the guitar. Well, uh, there are all kinds of uh, comings and goings of traditional music and contemporary compositional techniques on the new record. It's called Irish Minimalism. Dave Flynn, it's been great talking with you again. Congratulations on the new record. Oh, thank you, John. And I want to thank everyone involved in the record. Uh, thank you for your amazing liner notes and for, for uh, joining us here today. And um, thank to the IMO Musicians Contempo, Brendan, Mick and Judy, and First Hand Records, of course. The album's available through First Hand Records now.
And thank you all for joining us today and for uh, listening and watching. Yes. Bye-bye. Bye now.